do you find in your patients with type one diabetes that weight loss is required in order to decrease insulin requirements or is it possible to decrease insulin requirements even without losing weight? Both. In other words, you can't be healthy with excess fat on the body. Fat sequesters nutrients. So let's just say from a matter, if I had like a hundred, you, you gave you a glass of carrot juice, right? And I poured that carrot juice into a quart of water and I shook it up. You could see it's still orange. You could still see the nutrients in the water. But if I put that quart of carrot juice into 10 gallons of water and shook it up, it would dilute it. You'd hardly see any carrot juice in there. When you have more body fat, what I'm saying right now is the body fat doesn't sequester nutrients in proportion to the extra weight you're carrying. If you, have 100, if you weigh 100 pounds of musculoskeletal mass and you weigh, let's say your, your ideal body weight is 150 pounds. If you weigh 300 pounds, your cells are now not, the nutrients aren't diluted by half. They're diluted by 75% because fat cells sequester nutrients over and above their proportion of body weight because they suck up fat-soluble nutrients. And they also become a garbage depot for fat-soluble toxins. So the fat cells are sequestering and holding on to nutrients and they're also producing toxins because fat is hypoxic tissue. Hypoxic tissue which doesn't have a great oxygen supply. So it brings, it's more pro-inflammatory releasing cytokines and lipokines and more reactive oxygen species. That inf the inflammatory potential of fat and the fact that it made your body to be, have a to be more sensitive to inflammation because it's making you nutritionally deficient is increasing your insulin needs and of course increasing your risk of cancer, heart attacks, dementia, depression. So, the fat so yes, it's necessary to be a normal weight to be healthy. There's no such thing as an overweight healthy person. However, it is true that if a person is overweight and losing weight at a certain rate, you start to, you start to reduce aromatase, prom aromatase promotion, these inflammatory effects of fat start to be diminished, and insulin resistance starts to be repaired even before all the body weight is lost while the person is losing at a, a kilogram a week or greater. What I'm saying right now is the person can still be 30 pounds overweight, and we could still starting to see... Um, improvement in their um, parameters of aging and their inflammatory markers and their diabetic markers and their metabolic markers because they're eating properly and losing weight at a certain rate. If they start eating poorly or they start to stabilize their weight in an overweight condition, we start to see negative readings on these inflammatory um, mediators. So with the person that's overweight is, is safer if they're in the process of losing, not gaining, or even being stable in an overweight condition. So yes, you can still be overweight and be relatively healthy. I have that term nutritarian, a person who eats a diet rich in nutrients, an idealized diet to maximize human longevity. And I'm saying you're a nutritarian if you're eating super healthy and at your ideal weight, or if you're eating super healthy and losing weight at least a kilogram a week on the way to your ideal weight. But you're not a nutritarian if eating healthy and you're, at an, and you're at an excessive weight and not losing because then you're just consuming excess calories. Very interesting. So effectively, you're saying that even if you are overweight, as long as you're experiencing a downward slope and your weight is decreasing over the course of time, then you're at a significantly reduced risk for uh, heart, attacks. heart attacks, increased chronic disease risk and premature death than right. if you were overweight and stable or overweight and increasing. Absolutely. Exactly. Okay. Okay, so go back to what you were saying earlier. You mentioned that an inflamed, an inflamed gut can then signal to the hypothalamus, which can then promote the, the, uh, an excess appetite. It could mess with your appetite, and all of a sudden now you are craving more foods, and then as a result of that, your calorie intake goes up. So let's talk about the sort of gut-brain signaling. Who's talking to who, and what can someone do if they find themselves in a situation where they truly do have a massive appetite and they know that they're overeating food and they want to make a change, what can they do? They should be locked up. <laughs> locked well, up. You know, <laughs> you know, I always said if I had a person, if I had one of my daughters was a heroin addict, I would like tie her onto a handcuff on my body and wouldn't let her out of my sight. I'd make sure she quit heroin, even though she was craving it until she wouldn't have a craving for it. You know, what I'm saying is that sometimes people need professional help because their cravings 
for self and, and their desire to self-abuse becomes so strong they can't control their own behaviors. But of course, the place to start is always completely flipping over your lifestyle from a, um, you know, we have three, cate three general categories of food here, right? The categories of food are processed foods, animal products, and unrefined plant foods. And the, this place to start is to start a diet of unrefined plant foods, but I want people to jump in with both feet. I don't want them to baby step their way in. I don't want them to, you know, make little steps and, and changes and improvements because they're, they're, keep, they're continuing to have their alcohol, with their alcohol, their oils, or their sweets, or their cheeses, and that, that, keeps them, that keeps signaling the brain to want more of that stuff. They never stop craving, and they, they're always in a state of stress and, and the brain, fighting the brain's desire for those things unless they can abstain from those things long enough to have the cravings die down. So when I say lock them up, I'm saying that 100% abstinence away from the things that trigger your addictions gives you the most, you could say, um, the, the biggest chance of having you no longer crave those foods to resolve your addictive drives. So, I'm, so that's where, of course, you know, people could come into my retreat and stay here for a few months, or they can do that, do the kind of retreat thing at home where they're really just cleaning out their house, using a garbage bag, getting every tempting food out, you know, learning the menu, following the menu plans and recipes, and sticking on it 100%. Like, I think one of the things we're doing with this, um, one of my giveaways here is that like a T20, like 21 days of menus for diabetes reversal. I'm saying, do, you know, do, do the product, do the program strictly. Don't do it halfway, because when you do it strictly, then you're going to feel better actually quicker. Of course, the first week's going to be tough with detoxification and cravings, but it, but it goes away quicker and it actually makes it easier than trying to keep yourself with a foot in both worlds for the next year, trying to struggle with your diabetes, struggle with taking excess medication, and struggle with all these cravings and continue to have one foot in both worlds. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, you've seen that at your retreat uh, in San Diego where people come and they are completely underneath your control, right? right? They do what you say. And as a result of that, you're in full control of their exercise, the foods that they eat and of their overall lifestyle. And as a result of that, they have no choice but to lose weight, feel better, decrease their insulin use, get off oral medications and reduce their chronic disease risk. We see the exact same thing. People come to our retreats that we had been hosting in Costa Rica, had some in the United States before that. And we see the same thing. Literally within four days, the amount of improvement in blood glucose and insulin use is, is more than any textbook would have ever predicted. And mm -hmm. all of that can be created by making simple changes, but actually, you know, doing it in a very systematic manner that, you know, sometimes just requires complete cutoff from the outside world. Because, you know, a lot of the, the temptation that I think a lot of people experience just comes from the fact that, like, if you have packaged and processed foods inside of your kitchen, they're literally talking to you all day long. Eat me. Eat me. You know you want to have me right now. Come on. Open the cupboard. You know you want to have me. And so it can be really yeah. challenging for people to have to fight against that all day long every day. Right. And they have to set up their support system at home. It's some, sometimes more difficult for people because when they're trumming off cigarette smoking, you get all the support from your community. When you're, when you're an alcoholic trying to avoid alcohol, people are patting you on the back. But when you're coming off you know, the way other foods that are your friends, your neighbors, your family is eating, people are trying to sabotage you. So you have to really collect your team of people who are going to support you, encourage you, make this easier for you. And you have to enlist the people that you're close to to try to make to help enforce this, that you're going to stay on plan. And then the longer, the more days you can link together staying on plan, then you start to lose those cravings, your appetite comes and your taste buds actually become more sensitized too. So you enjoy the natural flavors of, of food better so you can really feel you're not losing anything. Because, you know, I'm always dealing with people and you can, you were probably the same thing is that people think they're giving up something or they're going to, I'd rather just die younger or they say and eat unhealthy or just shoot me right now if I had to eat right away. I'd rather be dead than have to eat like you eat. Right. You know, but, but, the, but the reality is then people eat this way, you learn the recipes and they eat this way long enough they wind up enjoying this way of eating actually more than their old way of diet because your taste is just, you're enjoying the food just as much or more, but then you have this psychological and intellectual and emotional benefits of feeling good about what you're eating, feeling good about your health, and, for the, and, and having more creativity, more intelligence, more the brain fog lifts, 
And I, gen I always have people that come, on my, that come here on my plan, whether their parents forced this overweight young person, this overweight 20-year-old to come in, and they didn't think they could do this or want to do this, or a person comes in here with doubt, thinking they're not going to like eating this way. And after they are eating this way long enough, they realize, wow, I really want to live this way. I feel so good, and it tastes so great that I can't give this up. And over time, this becomes the way they prefer to live, and they really can have less chance for recidivism or going back on their old diet or wanting to crave or desire those foods again. And that's really the ultimate goal is have people prefer to eat this way and the amount of food they choose to eat, what they require is what they desire. They're no longer desiring to eat excessively anymore. Yeah.